welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. My name is Suzanne Loftus, and I'm pleased to have with me on the show today Dr. Glenn Deason, who is a professor at the University of Southeastern Norway, who mostly specializes in Russia's approach to European and Eurasian integration. Dr. Glenn Deason, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for the invitation. So I saw recently that uh, great power politics in the fourth industrial revolution, the geoeconomics of technological sovereignty. And the topic is fascinating and very applicable to our topics here on this video podcast series of great power competition. So before we delve into the specifics of your most recent book, could you please explain to our audience what exactly you mean by the fourth industrial revolution for those that don't know? Well, it's typically, it's, a, it's somewhat of a contested concept, but uh, very broadly, it refers to the advancement of digital technologies from artificial intelligence to robotics. So the, when the digital space can manipulate the physical world to an extent that transforms entire industries across the board, so, for example, by automating the cognitive, we can integrate the lines between the digital, physical, and the biological. So, some who would argue that the fourth industrial revolution shouldn't actually be a concept, that it's a merely an extension of the third industrial revolution, uh, that is the digital revolution. However, I think it was uh, Bill Gates who framed it best when he said that an entirely new world and reality will emerge when the computer can stand up and engage with the physical world. And that's uh, largely the world that we're entering now. So the tech companies that operate your search engine, they will also build your car, grow your food, uh, they will automate your restaurants, produce your products, transport your products, uh, lead innovations in the medical industry. Uh, they will do your surgeries, uh, identify diseases, uh, manage your media, develop energy, organize smart cities, build the armies of the future. So it's very much across the board. And so that's why some argue that this justifies the concept of calling it an industrial revolution. So it will very shortly, it will reorganize or sorry, reorganize uh, the social, economic and political structures of the states and thereby also the way that great powers both cooperate and compete. Exactly. And we really need to talk about this issue more because it's not quite getting the attention that it deserves. And it's probably the most important thing that's actually undergoing or that's happening in our current climate. And these uh, technological innovations, economic changes, the way that we're going to have to adapt to these changes. We're already seeing now examples of how society is struggling to keep up with changes. And that probably affects uh, to a large extent a lot of the political grievances that we are uh, witnessing today, which we'll certainly go into more detail about uh, later on in the interview. So you mentioned that technological developments and geoeconomic disruptions in recent years have shattered the end of stability after the Cold War. So obviously after the Cold War, the US you know, was uh, the leader of the free world and uh, it was a unipolar moment for the United States. And there was a type of, uh, of peace. So could you tell us a little bit about these disruptions and, and um, what they mean and uh, how they've shattered this uh, stability that we're speaking of? Yeah, so, well, uh, during the Cold War, we usually say that this is when, uh, you know, liberal economics uh, they really began to merge and unite uh, the West, allowed us to exist uh, uh, peacefully and essentially not use economic tools for uh, this kind of rivalry as we had in the past. But I, I argue that that's not really correct because uh, the geoeconomic rivalry was merely mitigated by the Cold War because the main adversaries of the United States were communist states largely decoupled from traditional economic statecraft, while the security dependence on the United States by its allies and the need for Western solidarity due to this militarized conflict, it had a tendency to mitigate geoeconomic rivalry among the allies. And furthermore, the United States uh, developed and implemented these digital technologies towards the end of the Cold War and ensured uh, this continuity of technological and geoeconomic dominance. So when there is a concentration of economic power, the conditions are really in place for, uh, for advancing this very liberal economic uh, system, uh, liberal international economic system. Uh, however, it, it, it does have some conditions on its durability. 
And this is no longer the case because uh, China and Russia after the Cold War are now integrated in international markets and are also pursuing uh, geoeconomic goals. And uh, in effect, realizing that they cannot be excessively reliant on the US because it is a competing state. Uh, so not, not to be too reliant on the United States as technologies, its transportation corridors, its financial instruments, if they want to survive in this international system. And, um, and the, again, the, the, the basic idea is that yeah, we, we did like have a nice peaceful time after the Cold War and we had these ideas of a hegemonic stability. And, but for the Russians and the Chinese especially, I guess they never really fit into this. Uh, they never were able to uh, well, restore their political subjectivity under that system. Uh, so again, the Russians, they, they were seen as being shut out of Europe and the Chinese, they pursued their so-called peaceful rise, which more or less meant, uh, yeah, keep your head down, don't attract too much attention while you build your strength and uh, yeah, avoid tension for as long as possible. But uh, I, I, would, uh, I wouldn't agree that this was a durable or sustainable model for this reason. And, but also, I, I guess some of the disruption is that the Europeans also want to enhance their political autonomy now. So they also need to pr pursue technological sovereignty. So the Cold War is over and the Americans are, uh, to a lesser extent now, able to convert their security dependence into geoeconomic loyalties. So in other words, the Americans are telling the Europeans, you know, don't buy Russian energy, don't buy their weapon systems, also don't buy the Chinese technological platforms. However, they, the Europeans see it as, uh, if they want to restore their uh, political independence, they need to have certain technological sovereignty. So they're a little bit stuck in the middle because uh, as Europeans would like to maintain the close relations with the Americans, on the other hand, um, ha have a more e equality in the relations with the Americans by uh, setting up our own um, yeah, economic structures required for this political autonomy. Yes, that's true. So this unipolar moment was really just uh, short lived and was not uh, something that would be sustainable. And maybe the West kind of falsely assumed that it would be uh, longer lasting. I mean, inevitably, other powers would rise uh, due to economic liberalization. Um, Russia also benefited from uh, the commodities boom and the, the rise in the price of oil and gas in the 2000s. And uh, China as well. Uh, now China um, is very active internationally with its Belt and Road Initiative. And we're just witnessing other powers um, rising to the level of, of the US and the EU. And we're, the West is kind of trying to uh, fight for its, uh, for its influence, its continued influence, because it is being challenged in certain parts of the world. And now that we have this new, um, you know, economy and this uh, and this new technological revolution, you argue that excessive dependence on foreign technologies reduces the autonomy and influence that defines a great power, and that in order for a state to be more self-sufficient, they need to augment their technological sovereignty. So we've been used to this uh, uh, system or relying on the system of liberal market economy where we try to not have government influence in the economy as much as possible, kind of uh, and going by Adam Smith and Ricardo's idea of comparative advantage. So does this mean that we're now entering into an era where a more mercantilistic arrangement uh, is in sight? And are these ideas of comparative advantage uh, becoming obsolete? Uh, well, yes, to, to some extent. I mean, these ideas of Adam Smith, they were never really opposed directly by the economic nationalist and geoeconomic theory. It was rather the possibility of and the conditions for having liberal and uh, liberal economic system. So, um, so I would argue that a mercantilist arrangement often falls in as the natural condition. Uh, one could add, unfortunately, as a liberal economic, uh, sorry, a liberal international economic system tends to only merge when there's this, as mentioned, concentration of economic power. So under hegemon, so Britain in the 19th century, uh, the United States in the 20th century. So when there is a geoeconomic hegemon, it has systemic incentives to embrace free trade uh, often to saturate foreign markets with its technologies and thereby create this uh, technological dependency in somewhat of a core periphery relationship. Now, this was the incentive for the British to repeal the Corn Laws in the 1840s, 
and it very much remains uh, true today. So a comparative advantage will com will and always have continued to some extent, but states will they will uh, uh, want to manipulate this uh, uh, comparative advantage. And this is why we find that states pursue vigorous uh, industrial policies. So the, the states effectively makes investments to climb up global value chains. And I mentioned David Ricardo, he, he himself argued that comparative advantage meant, uh, well, to paraphrase, that wine should be made in France, corn should be made in America, and manufactured goods should be made in England. Now, the United States, they recognized if they wanted to have political independence, uh, they had to also have economic independence. So they responded with uh, economic nationalism or an economic nationalist policy by developing its own manufacturing base and obtaining technological sovereignty at the time. So this was a condition for political sovereignty. And indeed, this whole concept that industrialization was a part of American nation building was very much the key point of the American system. So um, the need for technological sovereignty in the 19th century is true today. And in the 19th century, we refer to manufacturing power. And today, it's uh, largely digital platforms. And you can say the same with the European Union. I mean, the EU established some political autonomy from the US with its industrial policies a separate currency and other uh, geoeconomic means. But if the EU wants to maintain its political sovereignty, it, then it really needs to also develop these uh, digital platforms. And, uh, and again, well, what about states like Russia and China uh, that, the deemed, uh, that the US uh, considers to be enemies or adversaries at least? They, they see greater need, not just for equality with the US, but they, they see the need to decouple from US digital ecosystems uh, as you know, communication, social media, payment system, uh, production, energy, transportation, every other aspect of society will be increasingly reliant on these uh, digital platforms. So, um, so the state, because the state is this highest sovereign in the system, in the international system, uh, sorry, the, the technological and geoeconomic infrastructure really has to reflect this reality. So that's kind of the limitations on this uh, more liberal economic system uh, with which we talk about. Yes, it's always useful to just look back at history. I mean, we don't do that enough. Uh, history is cyclical and uh, nations have undergone periods of time when they're more inward looking uh, versus more, more liberal. So we're perhaps just entering a stage where you know, we need to, to reform uh, our institutions and to act differently towards one another based on the changes that are going on in the international system. And, um, Domestic and socioeconomic stability is also imperative for the state to be able to mobilize resources and advance its own strategic interests in the international system. So domestic politics really does shape foreign policy in many ways. And right now the United States is undergoing some severe uh, domestic issues. And we can tell, you know, there's a lot of political polarization, um, you know, inequality, um, just, you know, wage stagnation, people are upset, uh, middle class is shrinking, you know, all those jobs have been exported to China or taken over by technological innovations and automation. So what do you think is going on in the U.S. domestically and how is that affecting its actions internationally as the leader of, of the world? Well, this was actually a key challenge in the method of the book, because I thought the great power rivalry uh, it ha has both a domestic and an uh, external component, because, uh, of course, in the external environment, states compete with economics, military communication, uh, you know, across the board. However, in order to mobilize these resources and act as a unitary actor, the state also needs to think about the domestic uh, cohesion. And I guess the challenge for the U.S. is the that the competitiveness in the international system has come at the expense of its domestic cohesion. So, for example, in the late 1980s, uh, the West established to some extent a very core periphery international distribution of, of, uh, of labor. That is, innovations and other high value activities in global value chains were assigned to the West. And in return, we, we opened up manufacturing to low wage countries. So, uh, that was it. We simply put uh, how the international supply chains were arranged. The result for the U.S. is that the tech giants could uh, rule the world, more or less. Uh, however, its manufacturing was opened to these uh, low-wage countries, and so the, the manufacturing workers were more or less thrown under the bus. 
And this is a comparative advantage to the extreme, which we refer to then as neoliberal economics. Now, the problem with this uh, very extreme comparative advantage is that society consists of real people. And some parts of society prospered immensely, while other parts were, well, lack of better words, they were decimated. The social economic collapse best describes what then happened in the US as its manufacturing was outsourced. So jobs went out, you know, the drugs came in. It, it was not, uh, it was very horrible for many communities. But furthermore, both the political left and the right, they traditionally had certain ideological reasons to constrain the market. So the left would like to redistribute wealth in order to maintain some, uh, yeah, some more economic equality, while the right also traditionally has sought to restrict the market to some extent to protect traditional values and communities. However, neither the political left or right could actually perform their ideological functions significantly. Uh, because of uh, yeah, this neoliberal economics. And instead, we see that the competition and the politics have gone into a culture war instead. So um, I would argue that the United States, the internal fragmentation and polarization of society prevents it, therefore, to act as a unitary actor. I mean, uh, culture and interest are no longer defined the same way amongst its people, as we now see with the polarization between the conservatives and the liberals. And uh, it will be difficult to mobilize these domestic resources, uh, both in terms of popular support and material resources towards common foreign policy objectives. And this, this could be a problem in the future for US foreign policy. Uh, I would take it even further. I would uh, even define the US at times as an irrational actor. And I don't mean that as a slur, but uh, rather uh, as a as a definition when foreign policy uh, becomes influenced by domestic infighting. Uh, so th this is uh, yeah this is problematic and kind of indicates why it's important in great power uh, conflicts to also consider the domestic component uh, again maintain uh, domestic uh, cohesion. Exactly, it's uh, extremely important in uh, the way that we should analyze great power competition because a lot of you know U.S. leadership has to do with being involved abroad, uh, whether it's politically, militarily, socially. Uh, through soft power also. And, you know, these, uh, these policies are not always popular domestically. And if the U.S. government wants to keep its constituency happy, it needs to also, uh, you know, follow what the constituents want. And uh, often lately, that's been something a bit more internal, something a bit more focused on the United States rather than abroad. So, that's going to be interesting to see how that develops. So let's talk about Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of creative destruction. Do you think this applies to our current era as technology turns uh, entire professions and industries obsolete? Because some industries are going to completely change as a result of this. And are, so are we on the verge of a great societal transformation? And what is that going to look like? Well, uh, creative destruction has always been a problem. Uh, so when new technologies uh, enter, they, well, that's where the word would come in. It, it destroys the former. So by the, replacing the former technologies, it creates this creative destruction. Now, the destruction of professions and communities is very disruptive and the adjustments are often destabilizing. Now, I'm not a neo-Luddite, but uh, arguing to smash the technologies, but this is a real problem that must be addressed. Uh, again, not by preventing technological innovations, of course. But this time, creative destruction, uh, I see it as being very different as the question arises whether these uh, people will actually be able to find new jobs. So for example, um, how many millions of uh, people will lose their jobs in the transportation industry uh, due to self-driving cars alone? Uh, and also, where will they go? Will the former taxi drivers now become programmers? Uh, biologist, it's, it's very unclear uh, whether or not um, the way that creative, destru uh, creative destruction was dealt with in the past can still uh, be applied today. Uh, and in my opinion, too many jobs will disappear and disappear across all industries. So it's too much, uh, too quick uh, across too broad scope. And there will simply not be enough new jobs to replace them. Now, I, I would point out that uh, other academics have different perspectives. Some are more optimistic, and uh, I guess you can fairly categorize me belonging to the more pessimistic uh, side of the discussion. Uh, but you can also take it further because economic intervention uh, 
well, economic intervention will be necessary nonetheless uh, for the adjustment or for permanent unemployment. Now, this is not a question of, uh, of political right versus political left, simply a reality that has to be taken account for if we want to ensure political stability, because if there's too much economic inequality, the system begins to fragment. Because if people are not uh, shared stakeholders in the new society, then it will be fought and they will have no interest in preserving it. Um, but you mentioned Nietzsche because um, uh, creative destruction, we often focus on this loss of professional income. And it's not only an economic issue. Uh, we often associate creative destruction and its remedies with uh, Schumpeter's uh, economic uh, perspective. However, Nietzsche, he had a very much a broader focus because work also has a social component. That is, work is a source for uh, dignity, morality, purpose, and meaning. So destroying the structures of the past that provided meaning and social cohesion, uh, yeah, they must be replaced with something new. Uh, otherwise, this will fuel the rise of nihilism and political instability. And I would say, to some extent, that already defines the current trends we're seeing today. Now, one can say, ideally, we should refocus our attention, as we have all this automation, uh, to the search for meaning by looking towards you know, the arts or creativity, reconnecting with our common humanity, uh, that we, you know, since we can often get lost in this atomized industrial society. So this could actually be the solution to our problems. Uh, but I don't see that has happening. Again, <laughs> maybe belong in the pessimistic camp, but my bet is on nihilism and political instability, um, unless this is dealt with in a proper way. Yeah, I think I agree with you because, uh, I mean, I can definitely foresee some problems uh, once the state gets even more involved into the economy. Uh, we're already seeing a lot of um, pushback today for the amount that the state does intervene into the economy in the United States, for example. Uh, imagine even more than that. But the thing is that if so many people will lose their jobs, as you said, there's going to have to be state intervention because what are we going to do with all of these people? Yes, as you said, maybe we can rediscover humanities and uh, the arts and that would be great. But until we figure something out, there's gonna be a lot of uh, discord and, uh, and attention. And if the state does not assert con control over the over industry, industry will start asserting its control over the state. So this kind of starts to look like uh, what some would call more of a fascist political economy, you know, when there is more state uh, intervention and regulation into the private sector. What, how do you see that unfolding? Will that undermine uh, our democracies in a way, or is that uh, not going to do so this time? No, yeah, no, well, that, that's correct. And I, I do recognize that this is a big problem for democracies uh, because the concentration of wealth uh, will either be a challenge for the state that is a rival uh, pole of power, or it will become absorbed into the state and then augment the power of the state, which, uh, uh, well, as history suggests, we, it should not be too, become too strong as uh, well, this will essentially erode a democracy. Now, states do have a dilemma, though, with the rise of these big uh, tech giants and, in general, the, large, the rise of large corporations, because corporations need to be large enough to be competitive in international markets. Uh, however, if they're too powerful uh, at home, then they will become uh, rivals and they will be able to dictate uh, domestic politics. Um, so what is the solution? Well, in China, the state has great control over companies, uh, while in the US, it's become, it starts to resemble more of a corporate state if the companies can assert their power over government. Now, again, Russia had similar problems as well. In the 90s, uh, all the resources ended up in the hands of a few oligarchs, and they effectively could begin to dictate to the Kremlin what, what the policy should be. So what they did then is, they went back in and took control over the strategic industries and decided to keep them at an arm's length. Uh, not in a very sustainable format, so they still haven't addressed this problem either. Now, the third option then between you know, state control or uh, the state controlling the, these uh, platforms or the corporation controlling it and then being able to rival the state would be to allow privatization in order to benefit from the competition, but then regulate it to ensure that the economy uh, uh, to ensure that the economy uh, grows and also that these uh, companies uh, are aligned 
with building a strong nation. Now, again, that's when we refer to more the political economy of fascism, when you overregulate everything to make sure that the companies uh, yeah, march in step with the state. Now, uh, just to make clear, I'm not calling the US a fascist state, but this is also a debate in the United States. Uh, that is, the argument goes now in the, uh, both in Air Washington and uh, in, all in overall is, uh, what should be good for Silicon Valley should also be good for America. So they should, uh, Silicon Valley should limit their cooperation with China and instead, you know, uh, work with Pentagon, for example. Now, uh, this is not a story about, you know, good versus bad forces in the United States. It merely recognizes uh, that there's a real dilemma uh, without any really good answers yet. And this is not just the United States. Other countries have the same question as well. In Russia, you have Yandex, for example, which is becoming this huge new tech giant. And what should be its relationship with the state? Uh, it, it still hasn't really been settled yet. So this is something that they're all dealing with. But, uh, you know, in the United States, we see that the tech oligarchs are becoming increasingly powerful. And we're even currently watching li a live show of this, uh, you know, very powerful tech uh, giants aligning themselves with uh, the Democratic Party more than they would with the conservatives, which is now causing or fueling this uh, resentment. Now, it's not clear to me how this could possibly end well. But again, I would point out this is not just a problem for the United States. This is something that, uh, well, all the great powers with their own uh, tech platforms will have to yeah, address and deal with. Yes, exactly. And let's talk a little bit more about that, about great power competition and this new era. So technologies are certainly going to influence this uh, power competition. And Russia, China, and the United States all have uh, a different economy, a different uh, approach to, uh, to this issue. And you mentioned that China and Russia are pursuing what you call a bo bottom-up strategy of developing leading technologies, while the United States is seeking a more top-down strategy. So, you know, these are quite different. And do you think that one of them has advantage over the other? Like, will one of the strategies prove to be superior to the others? And uh, in this, you know, geopolitical mix, we also want to mention the EU and where does the EU fit into all of this? Uh, yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, well, the top down, um, the top down strategy re re refers to the position the United States already holds, uh, as it's uh, already claimed the top tier of this global value chains. And what we see now is the United States attempting to capture the lower parts again, that is its manufacturing um, yeah, to some extent, uh, because uh, they recognize uh, the problem this has caused for uh, industrial America, I even though uh, a lot of these industrial towns actually wouldn't get the jobs back, it would be automated anyways. Uh, but this is something obviously was linked to the Trump administration to get, get you know get these jobs back. But we also see you know Hillary Clinton publish articles saying yeah we do need an industrial policy to bring these jobs back home. Um, however, the bottom up strategy is slightly different. That's the that would be more the endeavor of uh, China and Russia who began at the bottom of these uh, supply chains and to work themselves up and climb up global value chains. Now, yes, yeah, we discussed before in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the US uh, assisted in uh, developing this international division of labor where uh, it did the innovation and the high value tasks in global value chains while countries like China would do the lower tasks. So it was more or less an organized supply chain. In other words, the United States would invent the iPhone and the Chinese could assemble it. Uh, now, this was a modern version again of the British repeal of the corn laws by creating this, you know, they would make manufactured goods, continental Europe could give them, uh, you know, export their agriculture goods. Now, uh, this division of labor uh, that uh, underpinned the liberal economic system is now being dismantled because China is climbing up the global value chains and challenging the technological dominance of the United States. So in other words, in the future, you know, China wants to invent the iPhone and also assemble them. So this division of labor doesn't really, uh, yeah, it doesn't exist. It's not clearly divided as it was in the past. So meanwhile, the fourth industrial revolution, it also enables the United States to take back some of its, some of its own manufacturing. So the automation of industry enables what we call uh, reshoring as industries move back to developed states with sophisticated infrastructure. So in other words, uh, our robots will be more competitive than their low wage labor. And 
again, Russia is a bit of a wild card, uh, which has often been through history, <laughs> as it can either leap forward, um, do this leapfrogging technologies uh, and remain a major power, or it can fall behind and lose its great power status. Uh, so far, it, it could go either way. Now, uh, I, I would see that Russia, uh, it, it, it can't really be uh, the leading state. However, it doesn't really have to be the leading state either. Uh, Russia, in my opinion, should follow a strategy of uh, technological preparedness. Uh, so technological preparedness are defined as having the technological skills and the domestic technological platforms. So whenever a new technology emerges, it doesn't have to be the first one, but Russia does need the capacity to rapidly produce spin-offs and, and then introduce them into its own domestic te technological ecosystem. And we see that this is what Russia already has done. I mean, Russia is doing actually well. Uh, unlike other European countries, it already has a strong digital ecosystem. So in Russia, the main uh, search platform is not Google, but it's Yandex. Russia has its own web social media sites like uh, Vekontakte. Uh, it has superior mapping services. It has uh, its own, uh, I mean, superior compared to Google within Russia. It has its own messaging system. Uh, as you probably know, Telegram recently uh, passed, uh, went past uh, 500 million users which is also what I use. <laughs> and Yandex is developing you know, self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many areas where Ru Russia lacks the skills, uh, you know, e-commerce payment systems and such. But since it began this pivot from the West to the East, it's partnering now with China to advance this joint venture where Russia can catch up where it lacks the proficiency. But at the same time, Russia always makes sure to hold the majority share. So it has this technological sovereignty. It doesn't uh, become too dependent on China. This is a big no-no for Russia, because that would mean it would lose its political sovereignty. So again, Russia doesn't need to be the best. It only needs to avoid excessive reliance on a more powerful state. So more power and more diversification of partners and some more uh, technological autonomy and sovereignty. Um, yeah, EU. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, I think the EU is more problematic for a variety of reasons. The EU was very successful uh, before, largely because of its single market, which was more physical goods, but also, but it needs to uh, continue this by achieving the same success in the digital era. I mean, where is the EU's Google, the EU's Amazon, the EU's Facebook, the EU's China? Both Russia and China has already developed their own local uh, ecosystems, and uh, the EU simply has not done it yet. Now, uh, I would argue that if the EU and Russia would work closer together, and I'm, I'm arguing there's some systemic incentives for this, they could both strengthen and ensure that not too much power concentrate into this bipolar uh, geoeconomic distribution of power between the United States and China. But uh, again, sadly, our continent <laughs> remains divided and uh, this uh, yeah, contrib contributes to reduce the relevance of Europe in the world. So. I guess Russia has already picked up on this trend, which is why it's very quickly attempting to reorganize its economics to the east very yeah, at a very fast pace. Yeah, so you mentioned a lot of very complex issues just there. And it's true that the EU is facing um, kind of a strange uh, future because on one side, um, you know, the West at large is trying to make sure that Russia understands, you know, that they need to abide by liberal international norms and, um, you know, trying to maintain toughness on Russia for the times when Russia acts in revisionist ways by imposing sanctions, for example. You know, and also the West is trying to develop a more unified approach towards China. How do we not uh, allow China to rise too dramatically. But at the same time, the EU is signing trade deals with China. Um, Germany is building a pipeline with Russia. Um, and the United States is unhappy about these choices. So we see a little bit of transatlantic um, tensions there when the West is, you know, uh, historically uh, better off being unified as one. So what these sanctions have done ultimately is push Russia more towards China. But as you mentioned, there is maybe some strategic advantage of the EU and Russia collaborating uh, in the areas that you mentioned. So given all these complicated relationships, how do you see this affecting the transatlantic relationship in the future? Do you think that 
we're more likely to see a bit more of a of, of this rift taking place? Or do you think that the West will come out unified and strong against its adversaries of Russia and China? Uh, well, the West only really became unified after the Second World War in, in, in opposition to the Soviet Union. And uh, I, I, the, it, what's slightly different now is, uh, is China that is, can be the main source of fragmenting the transatlantic uh, relationship. Now, uh, I believe that the transatlantic relationship will fragment uh, as their interests begin to diverge. So first, uh, as China becomes the main competitor of the United States, uh, there's less in common between the EU and the United States. So first, the US sets its eyes on China and it will have less interest in Europe. And so the US will engage in more confrontational rivalry with the Chinese, as we already seen, for geoeconomic leadership, uh, a mutual confrontation, I would add. Um, and not just the American going after the Chinese, but the Chinese obviously partaking in this as well. And uh, uh, the US will then demand or expect the Europeans to follow them in this struggle. While at the same time, the, the Americans will have less to offer Europe as their focus is on East Asia. So I guess this is the main area where the interest will split. And also at the same time, the Europeans will have a bit of a dilemma because they want to maintain the good relationship with the United States, but at the same time, they need to establish certain technological sovereignty. And towards this end, they really need a more independent policy towards both China and Russia. So as you might have noticed, the, the EU was quick to get its uh, investment deal in place with China before Biden came in. So that, uh, yes, to, just to make sure that would be a part of the discussion that it's uh, that the relations are built on this understanding that the EU should uh, not, not follow necessarily the United States and everything. But uh, obviously this is also problematic if the EU and the, uh, the US should walk uh, yeah, well, hand in hand. And, and furthermore, the basic assumption of geoeconomics is that economic dependencies are followed by political loyalties. Now, the Europeans are growing increasingly dependent on Chinese technological platforms such as you know, 5G but it's across the board on other geoeconomic instruments of power. We're seeing the strategic industries, the new transportation corridors, new financial instruments. Uh, so the Europeans will uh, have more and more economic interest towards the East, which also then suggests that they will be less and less inclined towards joining the United States in their competition with China. And uh, yeah, furthermore, I, I would add that I think the Europeans and Americans they did make a mistake in alienating Russia with this zero-sum structures in Europe because Chinese influence is now rolling into Europe and uh, Russia really has no interest in supporting European solidarity. Instead, uh, as Russia's looking east for partners, um, it, uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't really have any problems with accommodating uh, Chinese influence, uh, both economic and political in Europe, especially Eastern Europe. And I guess a simple partnership between the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union on technology and economic issues could have made Russia more of a stakeholder in terms of preserving the existing order in Europe. But instead, it, we've done a lot to push Russia into the arms of China and essentially has no stake or no interest in keeping the existing order in Europe. So this, uh, in my opinion, is a historical blunder, but I know this is where often people split on the argument. Uh, so I, I think that the transatlantic partnership it will fragment to some extent, and at some point it will have to be renegotiated because uh, I think as Europeans, we should remain close to our American friends, but Europeans, uh, but if the Europeans don't develop technological sovereignty and pursue more independent foreign policy, the continent would likely be reduced to this political object. So a, a battlefield for great powers to compete for influence. And at the end, I don't think this is in the European interest and probably not in the American either. So I think, we would get there some point, but I think uh, it's too soon. Yes, and I'm glad that you brought up, you know, the other side of, of the argument, because as you said, you know, academia, scholars, policymakers are split exactly uh, on these issues. And many are too focused on, you know, Europe and the United States um, reestablishing traditional ties. But there's all these complex situations at hand today that we must take into consideration with the EU's place in this global um, struggle for power, really. And um, the way that we approach Russia, uh, that is also an extremely debatable and contentious um, argument. So you also presented the other side. 
And I just want to mention to the audience that you have quite a bit of experience teaching in uh, Moscow, don't you? And that probably um, helps you to kind of see the other side of the argument. Does being in Russia and talking to people there um, kind of help you in your in your scholarly research? Uh, yes, I, I guess yeah, the first time I was in Russia was, I remember, 2006, and I was kind of struck by, no, three, sorry. Anyways, I was struck by the contradictions in narratives because uh, the, the narratives and stories we told were so completely opposite. Uh, so, for example, in the past, you, before you mentioned that, uh, like, Russia is revisionist, but from their perspective, it, they say, no, actually, it's exactly the opposite. Well, well, what have we done? Like, the revisionist is usually opposed to the status quo, but they say it's you know it's the EU NATO who's actually expanding and changing Europe. We are merely upholding the status quo. So they're saying you know if NATO one moves into Ukraine, well we're going to keep our base in Crimea. If NATO want to topple Assad, we're going to help him to stay. And you know uh, so they, they they see themselves as keeping the system the way it is, so that they only use the military power, for example, for preserving the status quo. So so it's, it is interesting that, uh, that we, we do talk past each other because the, the, the arguments are completely. Uh, yeah, opposed to each other, and there's very little common ground, which is again, it makes it an interesting, <laughs> interesting uh, political area, given uh, that we do have this uh, yeah, miscommunication, if you want. Exactly. I mean, it's very, um, you know, it's it's a lot of it is about the definition of this liberal order. You know, what was it supposed to be? What was it meant to entail? And for Russia and also China, you know, state sovereignty is the most important. Uh, and then, you know, in the 90s, this liberal world order evolved to, you know, be very uh, focused on human rights, for example, international human rights and the responsibility to protect, which also got in the way of um, Russia, China, U.S. relations, you could see at the Security Council at the U.N. Every time there was a vote on uh, intervening somewhere, the Russia and China would say no, and the, you know, so... Oh yeah, no. Well, I guess that was the problem at the core of the international liberal order is uh, is that the liberal values the country will be decoupled from power always either. So the way the Russians saw it is uh, that the liberal international order effectively laid the foundation for uh, what they see as sovereign inequality. So, for example, um, it it more or less denied uh, Russia their yeah, political subjectivity. They always became political objects, which is. Why we often see the relationship, uh, even you know, as NATO and EU often conceptualize it as a teacher-student relationship. We will go and socialize Russia into these norms. Now, but this has real complications because uh, that, for example, means that uh, you know we we can interfere in Russia's domestic affairs because it's in the name of democracy. However, if they interfere in us, it's an attack on democracy. So it's it becomes uh, yeah similar policies, but uh, completely uh, yeah opposite. And that's largely what you see being renegotiated now. The Russians are saying, uh, well, well, we're finished with this. Uh, the problem from uh, yeah, Peter the Great to Yeltsin was effectively saying, we want to be more European, uh, which kind of legitimized this idea that, uh, that they would be socialized into Europe. But now that they're going east, they're essentially saying, no, we're, this you know, student-teacher uh, uh, relationship is more or less over. So. Uh, we will not discuss our domestic affairs anymore, any more than you want to, you know, discuss your domestic affairs to us. And this kind of explains why this new renegotiated relationship is why the EU is being taken a little, a little bit aback because they were a bit surprised that suddenly, only yeah, last week, that Russia began expelling uh, diplomats because they participated in protest, for example, and saying this is, you know, we can't part participate in your protest. The same goes for us. So again, this whole. Uh, th this is largely a repudiation of the liberal international order, simply because they see it as fueling this uh, yeah, sovereign inequality. And um, yeah, so it, it is difficult because how do we talk about values and power when they're at the same time interlinked? And um, again, this is also <laughs> a challenge which I don't really have an answer to. It's very complicated and it's, it really falls actually perfectly in line with my last question to you, is this idea of narratives. You know, Russia has a specific narrative and the West has another one. So initially, the decentralization of communication was expected to strengthen the individual vis-a-vis -vis the state, right? And to usher in an era of democracy and freedom. But in our current era today, we've seen a lot of um, repercussions that, you know, giving that voice to every individual has had 
there's a lot of chaos and misinformation, disinformation, and um, you know, fake news or you know, bots pretending to be someone else, fake accounts trying to really just influence people uh, into buying a specific narrative. So how can we as the state or, you know, how does a national government reassert its control over communication technologies? And how do we carefully, you know, align these strategies with our values of freedom of speech and democracy? It's going to be a bit challenging. Well, we, we can often compare the internet to uh, yeah, as a revolution in communication, similar to that of the printing press. Uh, that is, it, it changed the way communication functioned. Again, it, it used to be very centralized, and with the printing press, it uh, it was dispersed. However, this was expected to lead to you know peace and uh, um, yeah, more, more freedom. However, it, it ended up uh, you know causing what 130, 140 years of religious war. So. The, the power the question with the internet is more or less the same it's uh, i remember also in the 90s uh, you know this was expected to revolutionize everything no more could the state uh, you know control information and um, you know it was, it was viewed very optimistically uh, but the power the question is where will power reside uh, do you want the power to be concentrated in towards uh, you know some central institutions or do you want it spread uh, so i guess the concentration of communication it helps to establish order in terms of having a common narrative. If we all read the same newspaper, everyone reads the New York Times, for example, we're all more or less having the same conversation. While the diffusion of communication is necessary for an open and democratic debate, however, the problem then is we can fragment the entire communication space. So uh, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, this you've seen these quotes as well by, which I do quote in the book by a lot of these uh, tech leaders that they had expected in the 90s that this would just be uh, yeah, lead to a lot of human freedom and peace and stability and uh, yeah, be very transformative. However, they then realized that uh, they had unleashed something uh, different, that again, things were fragmenting. Uh, so we don't have the same uh, narrative anymore. We don't anymore listen to the same media. We don't have the same information feeds. Uh, we don't tell the same stories. And uh, this fragmentation of the information space is really fueling a lot of tensions as yeah, we also see in the United States, but other parts of the world as well. So the natural impulse by the state then is to take control uh, to some extent over the information space. And uh, we, we can't see this to some extent already. So algorithms are being manipulated by tech companies, often on behest of governments, uh, to promote what they deem to be good communication over bad. We see the emergence of this fact checking by states that often don't just fact uh, check facts, but they also fact check narratives and perspectives and arguments. And that's when we move uh, a bit in a dangerous direction. And also we see more direct censorship uh, in terms of deplatforming uh, yeah, emerging. So my point is that these technologies are creating pressures for authoritarianism. So therefore, yeah, authoritarian states might have then end up with some advantage, while liberal democracies will have more incentives to begin flirting with authoritarian practices. And uh, yeah, I guess we can all agree that's not a, a healthy development. Yes, exactly. Well, I think that uh, we just need to stop um, recycling old policies and start thinking outside of the box about what we can do to, to shape our futures, because clearly the change is already done and uh, we're already deeply in the middle of this fourth industrial revolution and all the political implications that it has as well. So Glenn, I'd really like to thank you for your time. It was a real pleasure discussing these issues with you today. Oh, thank you for the invitation again. Uh, it was a pleasure. And to our audience, thank you so much as usual for tuning back in to Security in the 21st Century. 